Hello again, everyone. This is Pastor Sam Jr. I am in the sanctuary of Christ Worship Center. This is CWC in Casa, our home church online. And we just had church in the sanctuary, and we had a great time today at Christ Worship Center here in Laredo, Texas. But now we're coming into your home, on your phone, wherever you are watching. I want to tell you that I have a word from the Lord today. I'm going to preach out of Luke chapter 22, the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. If you want to find that place and hold it, we'll get there in just a few minutes. And um, my message is entitled, Faith, Don't Fail Me Now. Faith, Don't Fail Me Now. And so I'm excited. I can't wait to preach this. And I believe it's going to help you, to encourage you, to give you some direction and some inspiration during this time. As I said, we had church here today. and We had a great time. The presence of God is wherever two or three are gathered. That's where church is because If two or three get together in the name of the Lord, He is in their presence. And when He is present, anything good is possible. Praise the Lord. Hey, listen, some of you have been so faithful and so generous to give. Those of you that are members of this church have continued to bring the tithe. And uh, beyond that, those of you that are not members of this church, maybe you watch from other cities, other states, you also have been generous to give, and I want to thank you on behalf of Pastor Sam, my dad, and my mom. We thank you for helping us to continue to preach the gospel, and I want to say to you just some simple ways that you can give. You can mail your offering, your tithe, to Christ Worship Center, P.O. Box 3375, Laredo, Texas, the great city of Laredo, 78044. P.O. Box 3375, Laredo, Texas, 78044 is the address if you want to mail your tithe their offering. On Sundays, if you live in the city, you can come by and deposit the, your offering or your tithe right outside the church. Someone is always standing out there to receive those of you that just want to drive by between 11 and 1. And then the easy and simple and safe way to give is through text. You send a text with this keyword, CWC Laredo, to the number 77977. 77977. CWC Laredo, text it to 77977. You receive a link, you follow the instructions. It's simple, it's safe, it's easy. And again, a big thank you and a God bless you. And may the Lord, according to His word, bless you in return for your giving. Praise the Lord. I'm trying to think, oh, one announcement that is so super important. This Thursday, right here, Facebook Live, CWC Laredo page, this Thursday, we're going live at 8 p.m. that evening to have a talk with Dad. I will have a few guest dads with me, and I'm going to just initiate a conversation with them about fatherhood. And for those that are watching, this is why I want you to watch more than or as much as the information and the inspiration you're going to get. And it's not just for dads. I sincerely expect that this is going to bless the family this Thursday at 8. But here's something else. We have some giveaways that we're going to be doing for those that watch, that watch live. So you want to tune in, you want to invite your dad, you want to tag every dad you can tag in in the comments. And between now and Thursday, let them know to log on, CWC Laredo, 8 p.m. this this Thursday, June 18th. And we'll have some giveaways, but you have to participate in watching the the program so that you will be eligible to win a gift. And um, the gifts are, of course, for the fathers as next Sunday is Father's Day. Well, We just finished church here, and I need a moment to catch my breath. And while I do that, we're going to play a song for you. Today's worship song is in Spanish. It's based out of the 91st Psalm, and it's going to bless you. Enjoy this message, and I'll be right back with the word from the Lord.
librarás del cazador, de la peste, del destructor. Con sus plumas me cubriré y debajo de sus alas moraré. Yo diré a Jehová, esperanza mía y mi castigo. A mi diestra caerá diez mil, mas a mí no llegará, porque he puesto mi amor en ti. Yo diré a Jehová, esperanza mía y mi castigo. Praise the Lord. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we've got a lot going on here, so let me get my thoughts straight. And let me say, first of all, thank you for joining us. And also, if you would, do us a huge favor and share the program. When you share this program, there may be somebody that you are friends with that maybe does not follow our page. And that's why we ask you continually to share this program because we want to be a blessing to as many people as possible. So when you share, all of your friends might be able to see it on their timeline as they're scrolling through and they'll join us. And we just pray that God will use us to bless as many people as possible. And also for those watching, be sure you comment, join us and participate with us by your comments. Um, we're so thankful and honored that you join us week after week. Uh, we are here at 6 p.m. on Saturdays. That's our Spanish in Casa service. We are here live in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. 
and then we're here at 12.30, as close to 12.30 as, as we can be uh, every Sunday. So again, thank you from, from, the, from our heart, from my dad and my mom as well. We thank you for participating and joining us and being a part of this online church family. This is, uh, as best as we can determine, not temporary. Things have changed in our country, in our world, within the church. And so we are uh, doing our best to reach you. We are doing our best, for those of you that are part of this family, to pastor you in this mode or through these means. And so we're going to be here, and we thank you for joining us. Praise the Lord. Luke 22, uh, I'm going to start with verse 28 and read down to familiar scripture, verse 31. It says simply, Jesus speaking to his disciples, not uh, too far here from his eventual arrest and uh, crucifixion. But he's having these last intimate and very heavy conversations and instructions to his disciples. And he says in Luke 22, verse 28, he says to them, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer or I bestow on you a kingdom just as my father has conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he turns and he says, Simon, Simon, he's speaking to all of them, but he directs kind of the initial attention to the disciple, the disciple Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. He has desired, he has demanded permission to sift you as wheat, but I... Jesus saying to Simon, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So I'm going to preach today a message entitled, Faith Don't Fail Me Now. Lord, I ask you now that you help me to articulate what the Spirit is saying. Help me to preach this with power and with clarity and with precision. And most importantly, that you help the hearer by faith to receive what you are saying to us today and that each of us will not only be hearers but doers of your word. We receive this word in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Faith don't fail me now. I was saying to the church today, that the Lord recently, in just the last few days, really had to rebuke or correct me. You know, God disciplines those whom He loves. And while our feelings are not, you know, it's not the greatest feeling to be corrected, it's always for our best when God says, let me tell you something. And what God spoke to me recently was how that I had allowed the storm that our world, our nation is, is, is enraptured in right now, I had allowed the storm to get into me. It's one thing when we are in a storm, but then it's a completely different thing when the storm gets into our spirit, into our soul. And I had found myself saying things like, well, you don't, I, don't, I don't know who to believe. I read this, I read that. They're, they're saying the opposite things, and yet they're, they both seem like viable sources. I just don't know who to believe. You can't believe anybody. You can't believe anything you read. You can't believe anything you read online. You can't be- believe the news. You can't believe this station or that station or this source or that source. And this language was coming out of me until the Lord said, would you please listen to what you're saying? And the Lord corrected me and kind of refocused my attention on the fact that I do know what to believe. I do know who to believe. And so this message has come out of the fact that we are in a time when God's people cannot be involved in this storm, this pandemonium. And I say that meaning not letting us 
not letting our lives be determined and the direction of our life and the mood and the attitude of our spirit be determined and dictated by what is all happening around us rather than the Word of God, rather than God's Spirit. I was saying to the church today that people are in such a confusion and people are so stressed these days that if you look online, some people can't even articulate in their own words how they feel. And so they have to copy and paste someone else's feelings. And, and, and the best that some people can do is to say, well, these are my words, but this is how I feel. And they go on to say how they're stressed they are, how confused they are, and, and the turmoil in their mind, and they're doubting, and they don't know who to believe, what to believe. And so again, the Lord is calling His people. I'm speaking to the people of God today. He's calling His people back to who we believe and what we believe. Lord, don't let my faith fail me now. So right from the start here, our our text being mainly verse 31 and on, Jesus says to Simon, speaking to all the disciples, most um, Bible scholars will tell you that when Jesus says to Simon that Satan has desired to sift you, that the you is plural, that he is addressing initially Simon, but he is also addressing himself to all of the disciples, all of his disciples. And so he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. So let me start by making this observation. And it's a truth of God's Word. It's a truth as old as the historically oldest book in the Bible. The book of Job is dated to be the oldest book in the Bible. And it's as true then as it is today, as true today as it is as it was then, that whatever happens in our life happens because God permits it. It may not have been necessarily sent by Him. Or it may not have originated by Him, but He permits things. He is a sovereign God. He does as He pleases. He is... He is a God who is in control. We are His creation. This is His creation. And so He he permits things. So much so that when Satan wanted to sift the disciples as wheat, he first went to Jesus to ask permission to do so. So the enemy knows who to go to first before he attacks you. The enemy comes against you only after asking and receiving permission to do to God's people what he wants to do. So sometimes we come under attack and we are quick to question, to complain, to to be concerned, to, you know, we get in this panic sometimes, but we must always remember that if Satan himself knows to go to God when he wants to come against the people of God, then shouldn't we as his people, when we are attacked by Satan, first go to God? Satan knows, I got to first go to God. So as his disciples, we must also have the wisdom to say, okay, I have this attack coming on me, so let me go to God and ask him, Lord, what are you trying to teach me here? Lord, how am I going to get through this test? God is a God that will test His people. I'll say more that about, about that in just a minute, but let me say this. We can debate whether or not God sent this pandemic. But we cannot, what, what we cannot, what we will not as His people debate is whether or not He allowed it. It's here. We have passed through these last four months of pandemics and all else that's going on now. It's here, God has allowed it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 teaches us that if God permits something, He also promises a way of escape that we can endure that test. Any test that you have, any test that comes to your life, 
you can know this. God permitted it, but He did so with a promise. It's an escape clause. And it's not an escape clause that just says, I'm getting delivered out of this test in a miraculous way. No, no. Read it correctly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe verse 13. He says, I'm giving you this way of escape, not for a quick deliverance, but so that you can endure the test. God permits the test, and He says, here's a promise, here's a way of escape, here's a provision so that you can make it, you can endure through the test. The test results will be to your benefit. So please know that if God permits it, He also makes a provision, makes a promise that there's a way of escape, and the way of escape comes so that I can have hope and faith to endure this test that I am facing, to endure this thing that I am going through. This historical time is developing the long-distance runner, the long-distance believer in you. This time, this historical time, as children, what did we do? We played games. We were outdoors. We did. As our children now, what are they doing? They're living in a pandemic. We've never seen it. They've never seen it. They couldn't go to school. They miss their friends. They probably don't miss the class, the, the, the homework, but they miss their friends. They miss playing. It's a different, it's a historical time for all of us. And in this historical time, please know, God is developing the long-distance believer in each one of us. So he says, Simon, not Peter, the rock upon which I will build my church. Remember, he had said, your name is Peter. And now he's going back and addressing him as Simon. Why? Because he wants Simon to know when the enemy comes against you, you can't rely on yourself. you got to remember that you used to be weak and lost, and now you are strong because I found you. You used to be a fisher of men, but now I have made, excuse me, you used to be a fisherman, but now I have made you a fisher of men. You used to be just wandering, and I called each of you by name to follow me, and I'm giving you a place in my Father's kingdom. You used to be dead in your sin, but now you're alive to God. You have abundant life, and your life has its purpose because God has a plan for it. And so I'm calling on the old you to remind you that you are weak, but my grace is sufficient for you. Don't forget where you came from. And better yet, don't forget where I brought you from because for this test where Satan has desired to sift you, you're going to need to rely on me, your faith in me. So I'm calling you Simon just to keep you humble. That's a good place to stay before God. Keep us humble before Him. So he says, yes, Simon, I know that you are a spiritual rock, but I also know you're a natural man who's quick to make mistakes. Yes, Simon, you are my disciple, but you are also my sheep. Yes, Simon, I taught you how to pray, but I'm going to pray for you also. Wait a minute. Did we just read that Jesus is praying for His disciples, His people? Yes, that's exactly what we read. Romans 8.34 tells us very specifically that Jesus, who died and furthermore was raised from the dead, does not condemn us, but He is actually at the right hand of the Father, always making intercession, always pleading our case, always standing up for us, always asking on our behalf before the Father. Jesus is always praying for us. I don't know if that encourages you the way it encouraged me the last couple of days as I was studying for this Word, but I tell you I have a a whole new vitality of my faith in remembering in having this conviction, this this glorious revelation and, and reminder that Jesus Christ is praying for me. And I'll encourage you with this. Before you call your pastor and ask for prayer, before you call the elders of the church, before you post it and say, somebody pray for me, this is what I'm going through. Before that, 
Remember this. Jesus is praying for you all the time. All the time. So let's talk about Jesus and prayer for a few minutes. Jesus, now I'm going to read to you just from uh, examples, just from the Gospel of Matthew. Now, of course, these are found as well in other Gospels, but just from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus and prayer. Jesus prayed while He was baptized or when He was baptized. And so when He prayed after being baptized, that's when the heavens opened up and God spoke concerning His Son. And so if we will pray, if we will open our mouth to pray, God will open heaven to answer us. You're not hearing from God? You've got to pray. I haven't heard yet. Keep praying. Jesus prayed when He was baptized. Jesus prayed for children. They brought the children. He started to lay hands and pray, and the disciples rebuked the parents for bringing the children to Jesus. And Jesus rebuked the parents. He said, no, no. Let, uh, rebuked the disciples. said, no, let the children come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus prayed for the children, and the, rebu- the, the, the disciples rebuked the parents for bringing the children. And I caution each one of you, don't be praying against, don't be rebuking the things that Jesus is praying about. Start praying about the things that Jesus is allowing into your life rather than just rebuking everything. Jesus prayed when He was baptized. Jesus prayed for the little children. Jesus prayed with Peter, James, and John on the mountain. He said, you, you three come with me. They went to the mountain. And the Bible says when they prayed there at the, the top of the mountain that the, the disciples saw that the, the face, the countenance of Jesus was altered. He, his robe even was glistening white. I want to say to you, when we pray, it will change our countenance. And your countenance is the real you. You can't hide physically. You know, we can wear uh, oversized coats and a lot of black to look slimmer. You know, we can, we can dress. There are other parts of us that we can... Our countenance reveals our heart. And a heart of prayer will affect our countenance, our attitude, our mood, our daily living, our, our attitude just going throughout the day. Jesus prayed for the ba- when he was baptized. Jesus prayed for the little children. He prayed for Peter, James, with Peter, James, and John. I'm going so fast here. I don't want to keep you long, but they went to the mountain. Jesus prayed for his disciples. And this is why he said, I'm praying for my disciples, Father, because you gave them to me. We should pray about the things or the people that God has given us more than praying for the things that we want Him to give us. Simple example is our children. Many of us prayed, Lord, I want to be a dad, I want to be a mom. We want to have children, we want to have a family. Some some people were told that medically you'll never have a child, and then they had a child. And those kids begin to grow, and are we praying for the things, the people that God gave us, the children, the gift, the Bible says, that God gave us as much then as we pray for things that we want for Him to give us. I pray for my disciples, He said, because you, the Father, gave them to me. Jesus prayed for Himself. His prayer for Himself was, Lord, whatever, or Father, whatever you do in my life, may it be to your glory. Let me say this to you, that if don't, think you are so strong in your faith that you will not pray for yourself. When Jesus Himself set a time, took the time to pray to the Father for Himself. But here was the prayer. Whatever you do, whatever test you permit me to go through, whatever trial that I must pass through, as long as you get the glory... Again, the humble position before the Father. Jesus prayed for Himself, and Jesus prayed by Himself. He prayed for Himself, and He prayed by Himself. When He went to the garden, He, the, he told the disciples, Okay, far enough, you all stay here, and I'm going to go further. And He went and He prayed. And I'll say this to you, there will come a time. Now listen, this was the most difficult this was the most difficult hour 
that Jesus was facing. He knew his arrest was imminent. He knew his crucifixion would follow. He knew the, the, the plan of God. He prayed, if there's another way, but if not, your will be done and not mine. His most difficult hour is what he's facing. And in that, he doesn't do what we tend to do. We tend to call everybody we know, text everybody we know, and post it everywhere we can post it. Y'all pray for me. I ain't never been through anything like this. Y'all pray. No, no. It's the other way around. That's the time to say, thank y'all for your prayers, but y'all stay right here. I'm going in my private place. Prayer, more than anything else, should be private. Not because we are ashamed of prayer or of the God that we pray to, but because there comes a time in your most difficult test that you have to get away, get every distraction out of the way, remove every influence, and say, Lord, here I am. Just me and you, Lord, and begin to pray. Jesus prayed for himself. Why was he praying? Because Satan wanted to sift his disciples like wheat. Satan wasn't, Satan wasn't happy. He wasn't uh, satisfied, is a better word. He, Satan wasn't satis, was not satisfied with Judas. He wanted also the other disciples. And because Satan came to sift the disciples, this is why Jesus said, I am praying for you. Satan wants to prove to God that you only serve God for the blessing. Satan wants to show God that we only come to church out of religious duty, but if we have to pass through a test, our faith in God will stop. But Jesus said, I'm praying for you. I know that sounds ominous. The enemy is attacking us. That's, that's what he does. But I have good news. Jesus is praying for you. What, what is he praying, though? Very clearly, he says, I'm praying that your faith would not fail. I'm praying that your, not your faith in man, not your faith in government, in the educational systems of this country, not your faith in a political party or a political candidate, not your faith in who might be the next president, not your faith in anything or anyone except the Lord. In fact, I think God it would, wants us to, our faith to fail in those other things. It would serve us better that our faith in man and our faith in the things created by man and controlled by man, that our faith in those things would fail. So to bring us back to the point that our faith is in God and in God alone. So Jesus was never really impressed with much of anything, but when he saw faith, Jesus would make comments when he was impressed by great faith or the lack of faith. So here's a statement that I want you to be sure to get today. You can fail at a lot of things, but if your faith does not fail, then you can recover from those other failures. You can fail in a lot of things. Now, here's where I want you to comment and confess. Like me, I have failed many times. Many more times than I can remember. I have failed many more times than um, <laughs> I wish that I had, but I have failed. Come on and admit it in the comments and or hit a the like button or the whatever button, but just hit something and just be honest here. We have all failed. But here's what I'm saying to you. You can fail in a lot of things, but if your faith in God does not fail, you can recover from all those failures. Praise the Lord. So Jesus and faith, and then I'm done. When Jesus said things of faith, he said things like, I haven't seen, I haven't found such great faith in all of Israel. The Bible tells us he marveled at faith. Can you imagine? You can have a faith. It's one thing that you can have a faith that impresses your fellow brothers and sisters, but you can have a faith that God, that Jesus himself marvels at. He said, the Bible tells us he marveled 
And he said, I have not seen this kind of faith. He said another time, it says another time that he saw faith. He always sees faith. Jesus always sees faith. He saw the faith of these and he healed this one. They brought to him a paralytic and he saw the faith of them and he healed the paralytic. That's how faith in Jesus is so powerful that he can see your faith and do something for this one. He can see my faith and do something for you. Jesus told another, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus was touched at the hem of his garment and he he turned around. This woman had faith that made Jesus turn around. Got his attention and he said, Faith, your faith is what has made you well. Be of good cheer. It's hard to have faith working in your life and always be sad and depressed. It's it's very difficult in your spirit to entertain depression and faith, sadness and faith, doubt and faith. But let faith have its place. Let it not fail in your life and see that you will have joy. See that you will have regained the things that you have lost, even your health. And so Jesus said those words to her, your faith has made you well. He said to another woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. Of all that Jesus could have prayed for. And by the way, he also commented on what little faith the disciples had. When he saved Peter, Peter had faith to walk on the water. And then he lost faith. And he began to drown. He began to sink. And Jesus reached down, lifted him up. They get in the boat and he says to everybody, of course, this happened another time as well. They, they were in a storm. He, he was asleep. They wake him up and he would tell him, where is your faith? Because that is the reason for the test. It helps you to relocate. Your faith is misplaced. Your faith is displaced. But the test will help you to say, okay, my faith failed me there. My faith there failed me. My faith there. But where, oh yes, my faith in God. That's what I have located again. So of all that Jesus could have prayed for, he prayed for their faith not to fail. He could have prayed for their joy, their health, their happiness. He could have prayed for their deliverance, for their families, for their future. But he prayed that their faith would not fail. He didn't pray that it wouldn't be tested because faith has to be tested or else it is not faith. He prayed that it would not fail. He didn't even pray that their faith would increase or grow. He just, kept, he just prayed that their faith would keep going. You don't need your faith to grow. You just need your faith to go and to keep going. He prayed that their faith would not fail. That's my prayer for you today. And more than that, that's God's prayer for you today. That's the prayer of Jesus over your life, that in this time of historical turmoil and testing and trials, that your faith in God will not fail. If you have your faith in God, you'll keep going. You'll turn back. Jesus said, Simon, when you turn back, when you, come make, when you make that comeback, strengthen your brother. This is how God works. He strengthens you. He encourages you. He blesses you. He teaches, inspires you. And then he says, now do it for your brothers. Do it for your neighbor. Do it for your coworker. Do it for your family. Do it for, for someone else. Especially in these times when the church has been dispersed. Encourage your brother. Encourage your sister. And I pray that your faith will not fail. I'll close with this with this scripture from 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter has remembered, he has learned what Jesus said back then. And he writes, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says to the believer, Be of sober spirit. 
Be vigilant. Be aware. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, Satan, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He always has and he always will. Seeking whom he may devour. He says, but resist him. Firm in your, here it is, faith. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. It's amazing the wording here and how relevant it is to today. He says, there are others suffering like you. And it's funny that he says, they, they are, uh, the experiences of suffering are being accomplished. I didn't know that suffering is an accomplishment, but that's how Peter worded it, that you are, you are accomplishing something by passing through the suffering because your faith is being tested and it's standing firm and your faith is what's going to take you through this as long as you keep having your faith in God. He says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself, four things, perfect you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. And if I knew you would stay online with me, I'd probably preach another half hour on each of those. The God of all, the God of all grace will confirm you. He will strengthen you. He will uh, establish you and He will perfect you. To Him be all glory. Father, I pray for every viewer today that they have been encouraged that You are praying for them. That You are saying to them, I'm speaking on Your behalf. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pleading on your behalf that your faith does not fail. That your faith in God does not fail. As long as you keep having faith, you will keep going. As long as you keep your faith in Christ, you will pass through this test. You will endure till the end. Lord, I pray their faith will be strengthened. It doesn't need to grow It just needs to go. Keep going in your faith, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me today. And it's my honor that you would log on and be with us. And I pray the grace and glory of of God. May He make His face to shine upon you. May His grace and glory be upon you. Share the program, please, and help us to preach the gospel through these means. And uh, again, don't forget Thursday, a Talk With Dad a Father's Day program. We'll have some giveaways for those that are watching Thursday at 8 p.m. On behalf of Dad, Pastor Sam, and, and my mother and Christ Worship Center, I bless you in the name of the Lord, and we'll see you Thursday night. God bless you.